I, I do have um, a topic that I want to talk to you about. It's called Believing the Impossible. It's a topic that I'm so passionate about and something that God has been teaching me throughout many years. And so I hope this really speaks to you today. It's um, um, a word, yeah, I just, I just love this topic. And so um, before we start, let's start with a word of prayer. All right. Father, I, I just thank you for every single person here. I I thank you, God, that um, you are in their lives, that you are uh, a God who loves them so much. And I pray, Father, that you would speak to them today. You would speak to them, God. Go deep in their hearts and uh, let them know, God, that you are in their lives and you do love and care for them. And I pray that every word that I speak, God, that it would be from you, Holy Spirit, that you would lead me in the right direction. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said? Amen. 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 Okay. Well, it's going to be about believing in the impossible. And as I said, it's something that I feel very passionate about. And, you know, I hope that it speaks, you know, hope for you today. Hope. Uh, we all need a lot of hope. And I hope that it really encourages you. Um, and I want you to know that, you know, through this topic that, you know, believing the impossible, it's not about getting what you want, but it, it's about, um, you know, God, allowing God to work in your life and knowing that God works all things out, you know, for his good, every part of your life. It's not about getting what you want, but it's about, you know, surrender to God. It's about your faith and putting your hope in the Lord. Before we start, um, let's look at, read, um, we're going to read scripture from, from Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. We have it on the screen, and we also have it in the bulletin. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 and 38. And before we read the word of God, you know, we always stand. Um, so let's do that, and let's read the word of God, okay? In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Elizabeth is Mary's relative, okay? God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Everybody say, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid, Do not be afraid Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. All right, before you sit down, turn to uh, two people and say, God loves you. Okay. So I want to start off by telling you that God wants all of us to believe the impossible, that nothing is impossible with him. You know, but there's one necessity to see the impossible become possible Okay, in your lives. And you have to believe. Everybody say believe. believe. You have to believe. And Jesus said in Mark 9, 23, he said, everything is possible for one who believes. And so to believe is to have faith, even when things don't make sense. And so what is faith? Faith, it's from Hebrews 11, 1. It said faith is a confident assurance. Everybody say confident assurance. That something we want is going to happen. Say, going to happen. It is a certainty. Say, certainty. That what we hope for is waiting. Say, waiting. 
for us, even though we cannot see. Say, cannot see. see. We cannot see it up ahead. You know, when my son, Colin, he was young, um, my husband and I would read the children's uh, Bible stories to him every night. And so he learned a lot about Jesus' miracles. And I remember when he was about four or five years old, this was in Maryland, we visited our friend's church. And um, it was during the offering time. So the offering plate, you know, was being passed around. And so he had money in there, right? And, um, and it came to us. And then his eyes got like wide open and he got really serious. And he leaned over to me and he whispered, oh, oh before that, I want to tell you that um, he learned the story about Jesus turning water into wine, okay? So he's got that in his mind. And so he sees the offering plate with the money in it and he leans over to me and he says, is that going to turn into water now? And it was so cute. It was, you know, a story that... Um, just really touched me. So I had it in my journal. I wrote it down because it's about childlike faith. You know, he, he, he thought that because he really believed in God's word, that, that whatever Jesus did in the miracles back then, what he read about, that he could still do that today. And that's what God wants for us. God wants childlike faith, you know, in us. God does not want us to doubt him. Say, don't doubt. God does not want us to doubt him. Doubt is disbelief, and it's a lack of faith in God's word. In the Bible, there are examples of people who doubted, and when they did, there were consequences. For example, the people in Jesus' hometown. Scripture says that Jesus couldn't do any miracles in his hometown because of the people's unbelief. Mark chapter 6, verses 5 through 6. And it says, because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Now, it wasn't because Jesus didn't have the power to do any miracles, okay? But rather, it was due to the people's hard hearts and their negativity, their bad attitudes towards Jesus. They didn't believe in Jesus. They didn't have faith in him. And so miracles, you know, they were for a greater purpose than, um, than just about a display of God's power. It was about activating their faith in him. And due to their unbelief, they missed out on the opportunity to increase their faith. How do we overcome doubt? The way to overcome doubt is by faith through hearing the good news about Jesus. And, you know, we hear that as Christians. We hear about that good news, good news, good news about Jesus. What is the good news? And some of you who don't know, the good news about Jesus is that he was fully human and he was fully God. He died on the cross for all your sins, past, present, future. He died on the cross and he rose from the dead to free you from the bondage of, of, of sin and guilt and freedom from pain and give you a new victorious life. And it's the one that is filled by the power of the Holy Spirit. And when you believe this, even though you can't see it, Okay, you're able to, to um, walk in freedom with power and authority that Jesus gave you to live a victorious life. You know, that sounds so unbelievable. But, what, um, but this is what believing the impossible is for us as believers of Jesus. That's the good news. To believe the impossible, you have to believe. But believe in what? Believe in what? You have to believe in the word of God about who God says he is. We need to have the right view of God to move in faith. What is your view of God? Do you see him as someone distant and not attentive to you? Or do you see him as a loving daddy God up in heaven who loves you so much, who embraces you and is in the details of your life? You know, to move in faith, we can't pick and choose what part of God we want to believe. You know, we have to believe in all of him. Everybody say all of him. All of him. We hear, you know, that God is love, love. Yes, he is love. But he's much more than that. Say all of him again. All of him. We have to believe in all of him. And most people choose to believe that in things that are possible because it's safe or they don't want to get their hopes up too high. But that's not faith. That's called faith. Fear. Faith is believing 
when we can't see or understand, even in the midst of a storm in our lives. To believe, uh, to believe that nothing is impossible with God, it's about making a firm decision in our heart to believe in all of God, okay? All of his character, all of his heart, and all of his ways. You know, growing up, I, I knew about God, right? And I, I, I don't know exactly when I accepted Jesus. I just remember I always knew and I loved Jesus and I accepted him. I just believed. But as I got older, I realized I didn't accept all of him. I, there were, you know, a majority I accepted. But there were two areas I had a hard time to accept. One was that God is my provider with finances. And number two, that God is my healer. Okay, I understand he heals. You know, yeah, internally, you know, your emotions or things like that that you go through. But I never believed in physical healing. So it was in my, um, with provision, that God is my provider. You know, growing up, um, I... Honestly, I did not know what tithing was. Tithing is giving God your whole, uh, the first 10% of what he gives you through um, the wages that you earn, okay? Um, any increases from the Lord, it's the first 10%. I never knew what tithing was. I just knew it as offering. I just generalized it. And I met my church would say offering. And sometimes they would say tithing, but they never taught on tithing. So I didn't know it. And I didn't know about tithing because I never read the Old Testament, the history of it, where it came from. I just focused on the New Testament. So I didn't know all of God. And I remember I asked my brother, hey, um, what is, what's tithing? What does that mean? And so he explained it to me. But, you know, I just, I never practiced it until I married uh, Pastor Stephen. <laughs> you know, I was 27 years old. And after we got married, that first Sunday we were going to church, he wrote out a check. And he said, here, can you hand this in? And I looked at it. I was like, oh, what is this? And he said, that's our tithe. And so I'm doing my calculation. I was like, this is too much. And, and he said, um, Anne, that's your salary and my salary. It's the first 10% of what God gives us. And, you know, I could have argued and put my foot down, whatever, and things like that. But you know what? How can you argue with a pastor who knows the Bible, right? <laughs> so, but, you know, I took it by faith. But honestly, before I started... Um, being a good steward of what God gave me in, with my finances, you know, I always felt like I was the provider. God gave me a great job right out of school, and I always felt like God, um, yeah, he gave me a great job, but I'm providing for my, my parents, my siblings. I'm going to be the one who could help them with these payments. I, I always felt like I was a provider. And so, but once I, when I got married, I learned about tithing. I, I started tithing ever since I was 27 years old. I've been doing it every single week by then. And it doesn't mean that you're going to have everything, you know, that you're not going to be rich or things like that. But God promises in Malachi 3.10 that when you bring the whole tithe into his storehouse, which is God's house, that he will provide blessings in all areas of, of your life that you cannot contain it. And so it's not about being rich. It's not about getting something from God. Because I, I knew one person who, who did that to get something from God. But God cannot be fooled. He's looking for the heart, a heart of obedience and a heart that's willing to seek him. So that's one area God showed me a breakthrough in. Another area is of healing. I never believed in healing. Okay? I, my church just never talked about it. And I remember it was um, when I was about 34 years old. Okay, I should go back. I was 14 years old. I was in a pageant. And I, I shared this with my church uh, a couple years ago, and I actually showed them a picture of it. And so if you ever want a picture, you have to um, buy me coffee, and I'll show it to you, okay? <laughs> but, you know, when, when um, I was 14 years old, I entered a pageant, and um, um, I had lopsided shoulders. My right shoulder was, you know, like this. And I never knew that until I was in a pageant, and I saw a photo of myself. My right shoulder, you know, it was like this. And I saw that, and I was like, oh, my goodness, that's what I look like. So for 20 years... Um, when I walk or for photos, I would take my shoulder, lift it up, and put it back, you know? I did that for 20 years. You do that for 20 years, you get quite tired. And so I was 34 years old, and, you know, I was Karis and Colin at the time. We were at a retreat. Our, uh, a friend who's a pastor, who was a speaker for our retreat, he came, and he shared with us, because he, he uh, really prays in healing, and he has such amazing faith in healing, and God honors his prayers. And he said... He said, um, he was sharing with me about how somebody had uneven shoulders and, 
and they um, and he uh, prayed for them, and they were healed. And I heard that. And you know what? That is the power of your testimony. You know, I heard that, and and I just took that as wow. If God did it for that person, then He could do that for me. So I believed. I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get healed, but God, okay, maybe. You know, it's just 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 a childlike faith. And so um, he wanted to pray for me. And it was in front of my church during ministry time. He asked me to come up and, and he prayed. Everybody saw my shoulders. And, um, and so he prayed for me. And then um, after he prayed for me, everybody looked at me. And they saw, even my husband saw, that I had even shoulders. I couldn't see. There was no mirror there. So after um, that whole service time, I went to my room. And I saw even shoulders. And so since then, I have not had to go like this. I don't do that anymore. I just, I'm, just, I'm just free. And, you know, people, yeah, it's, it's, it's just outrageous, isn't it? It's something that you can't believe. And, and it's because, you know, we tend to do things from our experience. But God wants us to believe in the, in the possible that he can do all things. And I'll give you another healing that I've shared before with my church. My sister, uh, my sister, before she wanted to have her second baby, she went to the doctors for a physical and uh, because um, she wanted to just make sure that she was healthy. Um, so she got a physical, and the doctor found a two-inch cyst in her abdomen, lower abdomen. And so she said, well, okay, I'll, um, I'll come back because I'm going to a conference in the East Coast. Um, so I'll come back, and then I could get surgery. All right, and so um, she and I went to this conference, and at there, um, our pastor friend was there, and she didn't share with him or anybody about it. Uh, she had just shared with me. I never told anybody anything to anybody, and the pastor didn't know. And he just, you know, he just prayed for her, just a prayer of blessing. She didn't feel anything. Nothing happened. She just received the blessing. When she got home, okay, it was within, within one week. Uh, she got home, made an appointment with the doctors because the doctor had to take the exact measurement of the cyst. And he went there. He couldn't find it. It was gone. There is no such thing as a coincidence. No such thing as a coincidence, you know? And so um, she said, Anne, it's God. It was just the prayer prayers that I received. It was, it was all God. No matter what they say or whatever, it's all God. So I want to ask you, do you believe in all of God? That he is love? That he is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love? Do you believe that he is your healer? Do you believe that he is your protector, that he is your provider? Do you believe that he is good, always ready to forgive? Do you believe that he cannot lie, that he is Lord and he does not change? Do you believe that he is just and fair, that he is faithful and he does no wrong, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that he is our wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, and prince of peace? Do you believe? That he is the creator who created everything in heaven and earth, the seen and the unseen things, including spiritual powers, lords, rulers, and authorities. He created the whole universe through him and for him. Do you believe? It's Jesus, guys. It's Jesus. He's our Lord Jesus Christ. And with Jesus, nothing is impossible. Amen? Amen. Amen. Do you believe in all of God? And if yes... You know, then why do some of us, we still worry? And why do we have a difficult time completely trusting him? You know, we need to believe with our whole heart. It's a decision that we make. And, and saying that God is indeed good and that he is trustworthy. So for some of you who don't believe, I encourage you to be honest with him. Talk to him and be honest with him and ask him to help you to overcome your unbelief. And he will. The impossible happens when we put our trust in him because faith moves the heart of God. Everybody say faith. faith. Moves the heart of God. Everybody say moves the heart of God. Moves the heart of God. Did you know that God, he wants to do the impossible in and through you, every one of you. And it happens through, one, believing in the word of God about who God says he is. Okay, it's about believing in all of him. But also who God says you are. Point to yourself and say, who I am. Who I am. Okay. How we see God, it affects how we see ourselves. It's like a child who thinks his or her parent is unloving 
And as a result, the child looks for love and acceptance elsewhere and feels he or she has to strive for love. How do you see yourself? When it comes to God's miracles and the impossible, we often think God does it through everybody else except for me, right? We think God doesn't do things like that for me. Or those things happen only to pastors and super spiritual people. Okay, that's what we think. But Jesus says that anyone, say anyone. Anyone, anyone who believes in him, say believes in him, him. will do the same works that he did. John 14, 12. It says, I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. I want to tell you that you have been qualified and you have been authorized to do the work of Jesus. We're called to do what Jesus did. He led people to faith and he did it through preaching, teaching, praying for the sick, signs and wonders and miracles, right? And wherever God's placed you, that's the area where you're to invite God's presence and, and give people hope in Jesus. It's your life that speaks about Jesus. It's your life. And, you know, it's not about perfection. It's not perfection, since none of us are perfect. But it's about what Jesus, what he did on the cross for you. We can point people to Jesus wherever we are, right? And it's through our relationships, our actions, the words we speak, how we handle adversity, you know, showing people how we handle adversity. And it's about real, and it's about being genuine. You know, I used to work, um, before we came out here, here, I used to work in the corporate world of finance for 17 years. And I always felt like that was my mission field. That's my mission field. And it wasn't through, you know, being forcing people, like, you got to believe in Jesus. It wasn't anything like that. But it was just through just being me, being real, and just speaking with love, respect, and honor, handling adversity, handling pressure, stress. Um, and they always saw, like, I was positive that I was always honoring of others. People would come to my desk and start gossiping about other coworkers, you know, and I just kind of like tuned it out, <laughs> you know, and, and I didn't gossip about other people with them. But it's just with little things like that that they could see there's something different about you. And, you, and it, it's even in school for the youth. You think, you know, my, my son would say, Mom, yeah, I got to figure out what God wants for my life. And I would say, where you are is where God's called you. It's at your school. You're a student right now. You do the best you can, and you reflect Jesus there, right? It's wherever God's placed you. That's where God wants to use you. Mary, from the passage you read, she was an ordinary person just like us. And you know what? God did the unbelievable through her. We're going to read Luke chapter 1, verses 28 to 32 again. It says, the angel went to her and said, greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and he will be called the son of the most high. You know, back then, God sometimes used angels um, as his messengers to deliver his word. The angel told Mary that she was highly favored, and out of all the other women, that she was chosen for the highest honor, the honor of giving birth to this amazing baby. He was no ordinary baby, amazing baby named Jesus. And he would be the son of God, the savior for the world for eternity. You know, Mary, Mary heard this. She was confused. The Bible says confused and troubled. And, and she thought, what? How can this be? I'm just an ordinary teenage girl. I'm from a poor background. I'm from a low status. How could something so incredible happen to a person like me? God's word about Mary was just so unbelievable. It was because, you know why? Because of what the world said. She was a female. She was young and she was poor. She seemed like the most unlikely person to be favored by God for an amazing task, for amazing honor. I want to ask you, where are you getting your identity? Where are you getting your significance and your worth? Is it from God's word, what he says about you? 
Or is it through the approval of man? Is it through your parents, your marital status, your job, your education, your popularity, your influence, your wealth, your accomplishments, for the youth, your GPA, and what college you may get into? Do you place your values on that? Are you hearing that that's where you get your significance? Whose voice is it that you're hearing? Whose voice is it that says that God doesn't love you unconditionally? Whose voice is it that says that God doesn't care about you? Whose voice is it that says God doesn't hear you? Whose voice is it that says you're not good enough? Whose voice is it that says it's impossible? God doesn't do miracles these days. Whose voice is it that says, give up, stop hoping? Whose voice is it that says partial obedience to God is okay? It's okay to compromise God's word. Whose voice is it that says God can't be fully trusted? Whose voice is it that you're listening to? Is it God's or is it the enemy's? And I can tell you that anything that goes against the word of God is not from God, but it's the enemy, Satan. You see, the enemy knows that God has a great purpose and a plan for your life. And so the enemy, the enemy, he's going to do whatever he can to steal, kill, and destroy God's plans for your life. And as a result, that's why you know, some people, they have issues with their insecurity, their, their worth, or they have a sense of abandonment, loneliness, isolation, fear, always feeling like they have to perform to be accepted. And they don't know how to love themselves. That's why it's important to, to, to listen to the voice of truth. That's God's voice through the word of God. I remember, uh, this was years ago, one woman, uh, she shared with me that when she was eight years old, her mom got mad at her for not playing the piano right. And she would say, why can't you get it right? Why can't you get it right? And so that made her think, those negative words made her think that she was stupid. And so because of that, she had, you know, that it's a, she thought she was stupid. It just carried in into even everything she did her, when she got into college, the exams, she couldn't focus. She just got really, you know, nervous and she could not focus. She kept on thinking, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. And they even, those words carried even into her marriage. One time her husband um, used, the, not calling her stupid, but just, but used the word stupid and bam, a storm just kind of, you know, went off. So sometimes the voices like that of negativity, it carries on into your life. Another woman said that her grandmother used to say that she was the ugliest out of all the girls in the family. And the thing is, the, the uh, parents never stood up for her, and the parents didn't speak words of life to her. So she could not view our Father God as Daddy God, a God who loves her and accepts her completely. That's the power of what Satan does. He comes in a subtle way with lies. First Peter 5, 8-9. through nine, it says, be careful, watch out for attacks from Satan, your great enemy. He prowls around like a hungry, roaring lion, looking for some victim to tear apart. Stand firm. Everybody say, stand firm. Stand firm. When he attacks. Trust the Lord. Say, trust the Lord. trust the Lord. And remember that other Christians all around the world are going through these sufferings too. The way we stand firm in faith and know God's truth about ourselves is by taking and applying God's word, okay, in our lives. And it's not just reading it. It's not just reading it like a history book. Mm, okay, okay, okay. But it's really just taking it into your heart and taking it like God is speaking to you. He's got a personal word for you, and you can learn from it, and you can apply it in your life. Find promises of God. If you don't know, if you don't feel like you don't have a promise, you don't know what that promise is, you have to open up the Bible and what resonates with you. What is God saying? Find that promise. What, what, how is God speaking to you? You get that promise from the Bible. If you don't read the Bible, you don't know what the promise of God is for your life. You got to open up that book and fully believe in it. So find the promise of God from his word and speak them into your situations and over your life and live it out fearlessly. Ephesians 6, 16 to 18. It says, God's word is an indispensable weapon. Everybody say Indispensable. indispensable. That's an SAT word. <laughs> it means it's absolutely necessary for us. Everybody say necessary. necessary. It's absolutely necessary. You know what's really amazing about God? Okay? He will always call out the greatness in us. Even if we're messed up 
and we don't have Christ-like qualities. That is so amazing about God, but that's how he sees us. He created us in his image, his likeness. And so God will always call out the greatness in you as if you already have it. I remember after my daughter Karis was born, and she, uh, some of you who don't know, um, she got, after she was born, 16 days old, she got sick with bacterial meningitis. And after she was born, I was just so hopeless. I had no hope. I was so depressed. I was so discouraged. And I, you know, I believed in God. I believed that he's my savior. He's my Lord. I believe that he is almighty. But I did not believe in the goodness of God for me specifically. I thought, why did this happen? Okay. So my husband and I, uh, we went to a conference where this well-known pastor spoke. And after his message, he asked us to come up, uh, anyone who wanted to receive prayer. So my husband encouraged me to go up and, and get rid of prayer because he really wanted me to be encouraged. And so I went up, and my husband came along with me, and, and his pastor comes, and he prays for me. And, and all of a sudden, he's like, the first thing he says is, oh, you have faith. And my husband and I, look, you know, we looked at each other, and we're like, that's not right. <laughs> you know, my husband was thinking, does he have the right person? Because <laughs> I had, like, no faith. In God's goodness, I had no faith. And, um, but you know what? Um, God was calling out what he saw in me as if I already had it. That's how he saw me. And it wasn't like faith just bam, right after that it happened. No, every time we get a word from the Lord, it's, he reveals it. It's like a, a puzzle, step by step, little pieces of step. And he wants you to progress. And it was through many years of trials, tests, hardships, pain, that it was through that my faith in the Lord just got bigger and bigger and bigger. And through each one of those, it was like a building block that helped me to have greater faith for the future. And that's how God will work in your life. There is nothing that God cannot do in and through you. The one thing that can limit you is not believing what God says. God says, and I really want you to take this to heart. This is straight from the Bible. This is not what I said. God says you were created in his image, in his likeness. God says he knew you before he formed you in your mother's womb. God says through, through Christ, through Christ, you are a child of God. God says by the blood of Jesus, you have been set free and all your sins are forgiven. God says if you pay attention to the commands of the Lord your God and carefully follow them, you will always be at the top, never at the bottom. God says nothing can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God says his spirit is in you and is more powerful than the one that is in the world. And God says that you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Believe in God. Believe in what he says about you by living it out. It's a step of faith. You live it out in your actions, your words, your attitude, and you let your life speak about what Jesus did for you. God wants to do the impossible in and through you. And it happens through believing the word of God about who God says he is. It's about believing okay, in who God says you are. And it's about obedience. It happens through obedience. Obedience. And um, obedience releases God's favor and his miracles. You know, a lot of people, we don't like to hear the word obedience because we think of it as religiosity. We think of it as legalism. We think of it as a lot of do's and don'ts, okay? But you know, to God, it's actually a beautiful word. It's a beautiful word because obedience is about the heart. A heart that seeks to do what's right in God's eyes and a willingness to follow his ways, even when we don't understand. Obedience is about a loving, intimate relationship with God. It's about embracing God's commands and his ways. It's surrender to an all-loving God, an all-knowing God. It's acknowledging the sovereignty of God. It's placing our trust in him with childlike faith. It's, play, it's, it's humility, and it basically comes down to love. A sign of our love for Jesus. John 14, 15, it says, If you love me, obey my commandments. And here's what obedience looks like. Uh, the author is unknown. 
It says, a recently licensed pilot was flying his private plane in a cloudy day. He was not very experienced in instrument landing. When the control tower was to bring him in, he began to get panicky. Then a stern voice came over the radio. You just obey instructions. We'll take care of the obstructions. That's my stern voice. <laughs> That's how God is with us. He says, you just obey my instructions and I'll take care of your obstructions. You know, God wants our complete trust in him. God to God, partial obedience is disobedience. Delayed obedience is also disobedience. And in the Bible, God rejected King Saul as king because he partially obeyed God's command and not completely. The enemy is always trying to convince us to compromise God's word and procrastinate when we know what God wants us to do. And God does not bless disobedience, even partial or delayed disobedience. You know, what's so amazing about Mary is that after she heard God's crazy promise for her, she simply says, I am the Lord's servant. May it be to me as you have said. You know, in other words, she says, I'm willing to do whatever you want, God. Okay, I'm willing to do whatever. You know, may everything you said come true. Even though she didn't understand, because how was she going to have a baby? She was a virgin. She didn't understand. It was something so crazy like that, but she still trusted God completely. And God knew, you know, it was because of Mary's complete obedience, not partial, not delayed. It was her complete obedience that God used her to have Jesus born for us. Jesus was born through complete obedience. And God knew Mary had an obedient heart, so he entrusted her with the highest honor that would affect generations to come. And that's God's favor right there. Everybody say favor. Favor. I'm going to talk a little bit about favor. God's obedience releases God's favor. I mean, not God's obedience, I'm sorry. Obedience releases God's favor. And how we respond to God's word, it can either release or withhold God's favor. Favor is different from favoritism. Favoritism is showing partiality. It's bias. And God doesn't show favoritism. God loves everybody. And he wants everyone to be saved regardless of their background. Regardless of where you came from. Regardless of your failures, your accomplishments, anything. He wants everybody to be saved because he loves every single person. Romans 2.11, it says... For God does not show favoritism. Favored by God, okay, it means that you have his approval. You have his delight. You have his special blessing. And it's very similar to the word grace. Grace, it's a gift that we don't deserve, we don't earn it, and we can't take credit for it. That's what favor is. Very similar to grace. It's nothing that you can do to receive it. You don't do things to get it. It's just a gift. You don't deserve, but he gives it out. No, we were favored by God when we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He saved us by his grace. We didn't have to do anything. We didn't have to work for it. He gave it to us freely just by accepting Jesus. He said, hey, free gift for you, my free love. You could come up to heaven with me for life. You know, that's a free gift. And God... He wants us to seek his favor. I pray every day for favor upon our family, for my kids. I pray for favor upon you, the church. I pray for favor of my family and just in every way. I pray for favor all the time. Psalm 119, 58. It says that it's okay. He wants us to seek favor. I sought your favor with all my heart. Be merciful and gracious to me according to your promise. Seeking God's favor with all our heart, okay? And it means seeking God's favor with all our heart and that it's saying that we wanna know the Lord's mercy and grace. That's what seeking favor is all about. We wanna know God's grace in our lives and God's mercy. And I'll share with you what favor looks like. Uh, a few years ago, I went to the Coach Outlet store and um, I, I, I saw this red leather wallet. It's a beautiful wallet and 
had a lot of nice pockets in there, so I could put a lot of neat things in there. You know, it was, it was nice and big. And I really wanted that wallet. But then, you know, I'm a practical person, and so I, I saw that and I said, ah, no, I don't need it. I already have a wallet that's in good condition. So I just, you know, walked away from it. And then just last year, I was at Ralph's, and I see, uh, I was at the, standing in the cashier line, and this lady in front of me took out this red leather wallet. This is the, one of those long ones, and it looked like, like the one that I wanted. And I was like, I really want one of those, you know. I really wanted it. I was like, should I get it? And I thought, ah, I put that thought away. And I said, oh, no, um, I already have a wallet. I don't need a wallet. So I just, you know, put that thought away. Uh, and then about a week or two later, uh, one of the sisters at our church, she comes to me and says, hey, Ann, come to my car. So I went over there to her car, and then, to my surprise, she hands me this red leather wallet. And I was like, oh, my goodness, that's exactly what I've been wanting for years. How would you know? And she said, I don't know, Ann, but God prompted me to get you this red wallet. I was like, oh my goodness, thank you, Lord. And, I, and this person had no idea how much it meant to me. And I was like, thank you, God. Wow, you are, you are in the details of my life. And I was thinking after that, I should have asked for a trip to Hawaii. Right? <laughs> <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. But you know, that's God's favor. It wasn't because of anything that I did. He, he gave it to me simply as a gift. As a gift that I didn't deserve, I didn't earn it. It's just a gift. Let me know, hey, Anne, I know the desires of your heart. I'm listening. I'm, I'm here. And that's what favor is. And that's, that favor is for all of you. You know, God knows and cares about the smallest details and desires of your hearts. And he wants to release his favor upon all of his children. And he's not asking for perfection. It's not a checkoff list. Did she do this? Check. Did she do this? Did he do this? Check. It's not. It's about the obedience of the heart. It's about the heart that seeks to obey and trust him no matter what. Everybody say no matter what. No, no matter what. No matter what. God does the impossible in the details of your lives. Everybody say details. details. He's not just involved with the the big, huge miracles that seem so distant from you. But oftentimes, God's miracles happen right in front of you. You have to keep your eyes open. You have to be in tune with him. He's in the details of your life because he cares about what you care about. He's paying attention to every little thing about you. You know, uh, my, my kid's 14 years old and uh, my Karis is 18 years old. And they still want my full attention. Colin, just yesterday, I'm, gonna, I'm sorry if I embarrass you, sweetie. <laughs> but he was like, mom, look, 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 look. And, I, and I, I'm like, I was just so busy. I'm trying to do dishes because I, I got to hurry up and work on my message, finish it up. He's like, mom, look, ooh, 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 ooh. And, and I'm looking for like this punchline, you know. I'm like, okay, I'm like, what's coming, what's coming? And it's, it's just that, my name is Colin. My name is Colin. And I'm like, okay, what is it, well, you know? That was it. And it was like on and on and on. He does this like every night. But he was like, it amazes me. I don't know if your kids do that. I don't know if it's a boy thing. Do the boy, because, but he does that. He wants me to, he wants my full attention. 100% attention. He wants me to look and not get my eyes off of him. Okay? Yes. That's, that's what happens. And, you know, my, my daughter, Karis, she, she's legally blind, and she has a visual processing impairment. She plays on the piano, and sometimes she'll say, Mom, look, look. And I'm doing the dishes, and, you know, I, I got to get things done. And I'm like, okay, Karis, I hear you. It's okay. I hear you. Because the piano's right there. She's like, Mom, look. Look at me. Look at me. So I look. Okay, I'm looking. Okay, and then I go back. Mom, look, look. Right? You know, the kids, we, we do that, and we're like that with God. We say, God, hey, look. Look at me, God. Look, look. Hey, look. Do you see me? But you know, God, he's already looking at you. He's already looking. Every little thing about you, he's looking. Like this. He's looking. What is she saying? Oh, I already know what she's saying. I already know what he's going to do. I'm looking. But you know what he's saying? He's not saying, look at me. He's saying, come on. 
Look at me. You know, I want my kids to look at me. Keep your eyes on me. And that's how God is. You know, he's paying attention to every little thing about you. Your wildest dreams and hopes. Your painful moments. What gets you excited. Your likes and dislikes. He's paying attention to the burdens that you're carrying. And even the single piece of hair on your head is important to him. And that's why scripture says in Luke 12, verse 7, it says, And he knows the number of hairs on your head. Never fear. You are far more valuable to him than a whole flock of sparrows. God didn't just know who Mary was. He knew every little detail about her. He called her by name. He knew she was a virgin. He knew she was engaged. He knew her fiancé's name, and he knew the details of her fiancé's ancestry. He, God even knew where she was, so the angel didn't have to go look for her. He knew it, her exact location. And God knows everything about you, too. And he wants to be in the details of your life if you allow him to. How do you see God working in your everyday life? How does that happen? And it's, you know what? It's really simple. It's through a relationship with Jesus. It's through prayer. It's not a, like a super spiritual thing. Prayer is just talking to God. It's through talking to him and hearing his heart for you through his word, the Bible. And there is no such thing as a coincidence. Everybody say, no such thing as a coincidence. No such thing. As a coincidence. No such thing. When things happen, you know, take it like that was God. There's no such thing as a coincidence. God is in control, and he says he is sovereign over everything. When you talk to God about the details of your life, he will answer, and it's going to be in his perfect timing, not your timetable. Point to yourself and say, not my timetable. Okay, so I'm going to give you an example of this. I'm going to share a personal story of my son, Colin, and I asked for permission to share, so please thank him afterwards. <laughs> well, last year, Colin was uh, 14 years old. He was a freshman in high school. And he shared with me that um, he had a crush on a girl. Yeah. <laughs> that was his first crush. <laughs> so now you share something like that with your mama, okay? She's going to want to know more. <laughs> All right? So I started questioning, okay? Because he's my one and only son. He's so precious to me, right? So I started asking him, hey, is she a Christian? You know, just because her parents go to church, it doesn't make her a Christian, you know. And he said, Mom, I know. And I said, hey, what's she like? Is she nice? And she said, yes, yeah, she's nice. Mom, stop asking me all these questions. And then, and then I asked him, um, do you think you, she's something you, some, someone that you want to marry? <laughs> I asked him that. And he's like, he, he just looked kind of confused, like, oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> And then I said, then, then why are you interested? It's a waste of time. Really. If you're not interested, why date? And, and be, I said, it's going to be a distraction for you for school and for sports. I said, you know, 14 years old is too young. It's too young to date. Okay, you got that, youth? Okay, you don't need that. <laughs> so I wasn't too thrilled about it and because, you know, 14 is just too young. So I went to my husband to get some support. And I went and, you know, he was working on his um, sermons, and, and I went to him with a concerned look, and I said, hey, honey, um, Colin has a, a crush on some girl. And then, you know, my husband, to my surprise, he smiles. Yeah, I know. <laughs> kind, of, kind of like, yeah, that's my boy, you know? And, then, and I said to him, why are you smiling? <laughs> why aren't you concerned? This is going to be a distraction for school and sports. You know that? And he's got to get ready for college. He needs to focus on school. And he's, and he's like, and it's, it's, it's just a crush. It will pass. Don't worry. All right. But I was still curious. I wanted to know the girl's name. Because, you know, even if you don't know the person, you hear her name, you just kind of get like an idea of what that person's like. <laughs> so he was working on his homework one day. I knocked on the door. And you know, moms, uh, even the, my, the teenager says, knock on the door. You still knock, but you still open, right? <laughs> I knocked the door. I didn't wait. I just went in. And I went into his room, and I said, hey, uh, what's her name? 
It's like, Mom, stop asking. I'm not going to tell you anything. You're not going to find out. And I was going back and forth with him on why, as a mom, I needed to know. <laughs> and, then, and then he said, Mom, stop asking. You're not going to find out. You're not going to find out. Okay, so we were going back and forth, okay, long time. And I said, okay, okay, fine. You don't need to tell me her name. I'm going to ask God. <laughs> God will tell me her name. That's what I said. He said, you're not going to, he's doing his homework. You're not going to find out. That's not going to happen. And I said, oh, yes, I will. I said, God loves you so much. He doesn't hide anything from your mama. Okay. I said, he reveals everything about you to your mama. And then he says, that's not going to happen. You're not going to find out. I said, watch. Okay. So after all that, you know, during my prayer time, I went to my prayer room. And I was praying, and I was reminded to pray about this. So I said, God, would you please reveal her name to me? <laughs> yeah! You got to pray about everything. So I said, would you please reveal her name to me? And then, you know, I left it up to the Lord, because I, I really had faith that he would reveal it in his time. I didn't know when, but he would come through in his time. I left it up to the Lord. And then it was about, I don't know, like a, a week or so later, a week later, I was um, doing laundry. I had Colin's pants. And I, I, I went through his pockets, okay? Because sometimes his whole room is in there, okay? <laughs> you don't know what you can find. It's like headphones, his school ID, money, you know, just everything's in there. So I went through his pocket, and, and I got something, and it dropped on the floor. And, and I brought this example to show you. It was, like, it was like manna from heaven. It was like this. It was like this. Like this. And I was like... What is this? All right? It, it fell like manna from heaven. And so I looked at it. And you know what it was? It was a piece of paper, one of those Valentine's Day telegrams. It had a, it had a blue ribbon on it with a candy cane. And it said, to Colin Chung. And it said, um, from, now I'm not going to share the name. <laughs> I'm just going to I'm just going to make one up. I'm going to say Jane Doe, okay? And it said, from Jane Doe. And then and it said, message, see you at Knott's, okay? I saw that. <laughs> I saw that, and I was in my laundry room, and I was like, yes! Thank you, Lord! Thank you, you know? It was a hallelujah moment. I didn't want to rub it in, you know. I wanted to be nice. So I took my time. He came home. It was late at night. He's doing his homework. I knock on the door open. And I said, Jane Doe. <laughs> Colin quickly turned around. His eyes wide open. And he goes, who told you? Who told you? And then I said, God did. I said, remember. God reveals things in many different ways. And then he's like, no, who told you? Who told you, Mom? I said, I said to you, God did. God, remember, I said, God loves you so much. He doesn't hide anything from your mama. Okay? And, you know, that is my story. That is my story. Turn to somebody. Turn to your neighbor. <laughs> yeah, turn to your neighbor and say, nothing is hidden from your mama. Okay, turn to your other neighbor and say, don't mess with your mama. <laughs> you know, let me show you Jeremiah 33, verse 3. And this is what God says, call to me and I will answer you and tell you great and unsearchable things you do not know. That is God's word. God's word never fails. Amen? Amen. What? Is impossible with man is what is impossible with man is possible with God. Okay. Believing in God's word makes the impossible possible. When we completely trust, God says in the Bible, 
He will make our path straight. That's from Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. He will be with us wherever we go, Joshua 1, 9. He will never abandon us, Psalm 9, 10. And he will be complete, and we will be completely filled with joy and peace because we trust in him, Romans 15, 13. My husband and I, uh, we have heard many testimonies of individuals overcoming impossibilities and, and stories of hope. And do you know what's so beautiful about them? They have one thing in common. They're ordinary individuals, but God did the extraordinary in and through them. And even with our, our own church family, and I wanna share a few stories with you. And I did ask for permission to share their uh, personal stories with them and they all said, okay. The first is, Pastor Sam, you know, he shared with us, all of us in his message a couple months ago, that he and his wife, Helen, went through four miscarriages. You know, having one miscarriage is hard. But can you imagine four? That is super, super hard, right? The enemy wanted to silence them, but their praises to God Almighty couldn't be contained. For God said in his word, weeping may last through the night, but joy comes with the morning. Today, Pastor Sam and Helen are on fire every Sunday, leading us in powerful worship. Amen. Who said it was impossible to get back up and give God all our praise after great pain? Our sister here, Eileen, she was told that she wouldn't be able to conceive children naturally that the only way was through IVF, in vitro fertilization. The enemy wanted to wipe out hope, but hope arose after hearing, hearing prayers of faith. But God said in his word, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Today, Eileen will be having her baby very soon. And by the way, the baby was conceived naturally. Who said it was impossible for God to do a miracle today? And we have another wonderful couple here, Mark and Sue. Uh, my husband and I prayed for them for close to 10 years for Sue's salvation and for their family to attend church, any church. And the enemy wanted us to give up, but we continued to pray. And for God said in his word, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Today, Sue is saved. She accepted, yeah. Amen. She is saved. She accepted Jesus as her Lord and Savior this past March. And Sue, Mark, and their three beautiful children are members of Revival Church. And Mark is serving on the setup team. So that, yes. He's serving on the setup team so that others, he's helping others encounter Jesus. God always gives us more than we ask for. Who said it was impossible for God to answer prayers that seemed hopeless for close to a decade? You know, church, nothing is impossible with Jesus. Let's be a people of faith, encouraging one another and building faith with our own personal stories of hope. Personal stories of hope. Let's not be the ones who cancel hope by giving out words of doubt and negativity and even holding bitterness in our heart when things don't go our way or it seems like God hasn't come through. Dream, and especially for the youth, I wanna say dream and dream big because there's nothing that God cannot do in and through you. And for the youth, when they say, I wanna be this and that, adults, please allow them to dream. Don't. Don't cancel it by saying, oh, do you know it's only 1% of the, you know, who actually make it or let them dream, let them dream. We, we're not the boss. God is the boss of their lives. What promise has God given you through his word? If you're still waiting, don't compromise. Don't give up. Keep believing in obedience and trust. And you'll see the favor of God on your life 
just like Mary did. Don't disregard God's word and disbelief, but treasure it deeply in your heart. And that's what Mary did. Keep thinking about it as a way of reminding yourself of what God said. God said that not one promise from God is empty of power, for nothing is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. Okay, let's pray.